Detective James Clift and Sergeant Glenn Blatnikov from the Middleburg Heights, Ohio Police Department are investigating an unsolved rape when they see the teletype from the nearby Lakewood Police Department about the arrest of firefighter Thomas McCarthy. They immediately notice the similarity between the way the rapist in their case was dressed and the way McCarthy was dressed when he broke into the Kilroy home. It was obvious to us uh, when he was caught in Lakewood that it, this was going to be our guy. He had a stocking over his face. He was wearing the rubber gloves. He had a knife in his pocket. The rapist left no clues to his identity. There was no sign of forced entry, no sign of struggle, and he didn't leave any physical evidence at the crime scene. But there were indications that he had carefully thought out what he was going to do. It would just be indicative of somebody that had planned it. It wasn't like something just spur in a moment type of thing, where he would have left, you know, little things unturned, you know, or left something behind that could have been a key piece of evidence at that time. Obviously, he, you know, knew what to take out of there. He also planned what he wanted to do to the victim. For nearly three hours, he held her captive in her house, tied her to a pole in her basement, sexually assaulted and tortured her with a stun gun. He's one of the more sadistic people that I've come across um, at, at what he did to her as a victim. Following the rape, the Middleburg Heights police received a call that a blue minivan, similar to McCarthy's, had been seen repeatedly driving past the homes of both the rape victim and her parents. At that time, McCarthy was brought in for questioning. And we had no, nothing to tie him to, uh, to our victim. Uh, he denied knowing our victim. He denied being on her street. He denied being on her uh, mother's street. He did match the general physical description of the, uh, of the assailant. But with no conclusive evidence to link him to the rape and torture, McCarthy was released. One of the few things that police learned during the course of their investigation is that several months before the Middleburg Heights rape, a house guest of the victim saw a man on the front porch taking mail out of the mailbox. Knowing that Lakewood police had found mail in McCarthy's home, the Middleburg Heights police conduct their own search of McCarthy's house, looking for something to connect him to the rape. I mean, there was just, just piles and piles and piles of stuff everywhere in that house. And we would try to go through every piece of paper we could on you know, every piece of clothing we could. The search continues until help comes from an unexpected source, McCarthy's wife. We'd, we'd asked her if there was anything in the house that, that may help us uh, and save some time. She went downstairs along with us and she showed us a pile of uh, letters and mail and in that stack was a, uh, a couple magazines with our victim's name on it. That's the smoking gun that we were, we needed to link McCarthy to our rape. The police have caught McCarthy at the Kilroy apartment and now link him to a rape. But McCarthy still isn't talking. And so the question remains, what about the names, license plate numbers, and mail that police found? Never in my experience in 23 years in law enforcement I've seen anything of this magnitude as far as one individual uh, you know, maintaining and, and, and compiling all this information on so many other people for criminal intent. Believing there might be other victims, Cuyahoga County Prosecuting Attorney William Mason organizes a task force to investigate the more than 2,000 names found on the scraps of paper that McCarthy collected. So I um, took my staff and we were putting them around the clock to try to track who these people were. Prosecutor William Mason's office. It took about three weeks to get all that information. You're calling on the list. Then I summoned every single police agency throughout the Midwest who had an address that attached to one of those license numbers or names or whatever. What police know so far is that they are dealing with a serial stalker who has methodically hunted thousands of women and brutally raped and tortured at least one. Mason briefs 130 police agencies from around the region. Brought him here to the Justice Center, told him what we had, and asked him to go back to their uh, districts and try to look for any old cases or any crimes that would fit this pattern. And then also to go make contact with these victims to find out if They've been maybe followed, if they've been chased, if they know who this guy is. Most of the females involved were adults uh, from 20s to 40s, you know, to 50s. You know, uh, many of the women um, had no knowledge that he was doing this. And they were homemakers, they were um, uh, business people, they were um, clerks. I mean, he didn't seem to have a particular characteristics that, that he, he um, chose. Quite frankly, it terrified some of them just to think that uh, this person of this sadistic nature was out there stalking them. Nobody was safe from him. There were no bounds. He was throughout the whole state of Ohio. 
From the investigation, a portrait of McCarthy's double life begins to emerge. He had a, appeared on one side of his life to be just the perfect husband, father, firefighter, community, civic servant. Uh, but he had a, a scary and dark side that um, he hid from everybody who knew him. Tom Bradshaw had been his friend for 30 years. I first met him uh, in high school. We went to a Catholic high school together in ninth grade. Um, we were both about 14 years old. On the weekend of the arrest, they were supposed to get together for a Labor Day picnic with some other high school friends, but McCarthy never showed. The next day, there was a small article in the newspaper that said that he'd been arrested uh, for uh, breaking into a home. I read it and I thought it was a mistake. I kind of thought that I would read about him trying to save someone's life. I never, never, you know, in my wildest dreams thought it would be for anything criminal whatsoever. When we found out, it hit us below the belt, but it, it didn't have anything to do with him being a fireman or, or even a family man. He was a good family man, you know. So it, we're still recovering. He was kind of shy, if anything. He was well-liked. Uh, everybody trusted him, um, thought he was a nice guy. Um, it was very normal. No neglect, no abuse in his childhood, no uh, trauma of any kind. His parents were ideal parents, wonderful parents. McCarthy is the oldest of seven children. Like his father and three of his brothers, he became a firefighter joining the department when he was in his mid-twenties. That was all that uh, Tom was interested in being in high school. He didn't have no interest in going to college or anything like that. He just wanted to be a uh, Cleveland firefighter like his father. After high school, Bradshaw and McCarthy remained close friends. We were in each other's wedding, and he was my best man. And as time went on, we didn't see each other as often, but we would go out once in a while. You know, he would never leave early to follow someone home, leave a bar early, or stay after we left to follow someone, or say anything that was, uh, you know, unusual or out of line or improper that, you know, ever made us think anything. After the arrest, Bradshaw went to see McCarthy in jail. I asked him if he'd ever thought about getting caught, if he expected to end up in jail. And he said, no, I never thought about getting caught. He said, I was, I was too careful, I was too smart. They weren't gonna catch me. But they did. When we return, investigators discover how and why McCarthy became a serial stalker. What I wanted to do was scare him and, and torture him, cause him physical pain. 